This video serves as support for the practical sessions of the mini volleyball unit during the level 1 coaches course held in Porto in 2014. Mainly we intend to provide a structuring of collective game structures but also to deliver some considerations about training and teaching philosophy in this context. The first task we have to undertake is to review our knowledge and our under understanding of things. Namely, we have to stop taking things for granted. For example, how much is 1 plus 1? If I have a volleyball and now I buy another one, I have two volleyballs. This is basic math. Now imagine that I instead have a t-shirt and I have a number 1 to stamp on it. If I now add another, another number 1, I get number 11. So in this case, 1 plus 1 equals 11, not 2. What about fluids? One drop of water plus one drop of water provide one drop of water. So the overall message is not taking things for granted. There are no all-feeding prescriptions and what you need is an attitude of critical thinking. Starting from critical thinking, some schools of thought seem to demonize competition. So let's just get this out of the way. Competition is the core aspect of training and is fundamental regardless of age. Besides being highly motivating in itself, it provides the reason for training and the tools to constantly adjust the training performance. So, entering the structure of mini volleyball. Like the 6v6 game, it has a well-known logic. Distinct game complexes can be identified, each presenting a set of regularities and constraints that should be taken into account. So complex 0 comprises the serve, while complex 1 or side out is the action of responding to that serve. Complex 2 consists in counter-attacking the side out, while complex 3 represents the counter-attack to a previous counter-attack. Complex 4 is the attack coverage, while complex 5 is represented by the free ball and down ball. In practical terms, the serve is often associated with complex 2, as it is used with tactical intentions and thus can be used in partnership with the counter-attack. For example, if a mini volleyball team struggles with the back set, we can serve towards the side opposite to that of the best attacker. The ball will hardly be attacked by that player, so we can already displace our block and defense to prepare for the secondary attacker. Also, for most practical purposes, at most game levels, K2 and K3 are highly similar and can thus be grouped for functional purposes. In sum, as mini volleyball coaches, we should teach our athletes the concepts and constraints of side out, transition or counter attack attack coverage, and free ball and down ball. Starting with the 2v2 game. And initially structuring the side out phase. Perhaps the easiest and most popular way to begin with is the 0-2 structure, where both players are nearly side by side, each occupying half of the court. This simple game already provides technical richness for the server, for example. Is he going to serve short or long to a specific player or to an area of conflict. Also, the receivers have to learn how to adjust their positioning in function of the server. Very importantly, players have to learn to differentiate the roles of receiver and non-receiver. As soon as there is a serve, the non-receiver should immediately run up towards the net and assume the role of setter. Communication is of the utmost importance when the serve is directed towards the conflict zone. Another interesting option, afforded by receptions directed towards the middle of the net, is attacking behind the setter. This introduces more technical choices, keeps the opponent worried with the whole of the net, and the back set emerges naturally. Now, as young players struggle to create a functional attack space after short or long serves, we should make them practice these situations very often. In this case, after a short serve, the receiver has to move back again in order to create a space for attacking that allows him a favorable positioning for the run-up. Alternatively, 
it is possible to organize the side out using a 1-1 structure. In this case, the receiver has to assume responsibility for around 95% of the court. Besides being a great way of enhancing his displacement ability, it also affords more chances to practice lateral receptions. The risk when using these situations concerns the remaining 5% of the court. If the server is successful in performing short serves to the setter, there is a strong risk of the receiving team losing the ball or at least not being able to organize the attack. Again, it is up to us coaches to create drills for stimulating the proper conversion of roles in this case. Moving on to transition or counter-attack. The O2 structure is good for counter-attacking against teams that are poor in the net actions, not having a menacing attack. In most cases, however, transition will be potentiated by a 1-1 structure. So we now have to define if the block is going to be 1, that is taking the parallel shot, or 2, taking the cross-court short shot. So the defenders now must better read the game, namely the attacker's cues, in order to anticipate and be able to defend such a wide space. If the set is of poor quality, or if the attacker is weak, the blocker may simply leave the net and assist in defense. A note concerning the courts. We can make them long and narrow, which promotes certain game behaviors, as we can see here. Or we can instead make them short and wide, promoting a different set of behaviors. So it all depends on our goals and on the actions we wish to prioritize. If the purpose is to play with handicap, asymmetric courts could do the trick as could special asymmetric rules, of course. In general, if you wish to promote the game, the courts should be big. Instead, most people think small courts are better for younger people, but that is not exactly right. Essentially, try and see how your athletes will react. That is the best tip. We should also manipulate the net according to our momentary interests. While a lower net will promote net actions to a greater extent, game continuity and game density will be enhanced using a higher net. Okay, so we've covered the 2v2, the courts and the net. So what about the 1v1 game? Shouldn't it be approached before the 2v2 game, at least with our youngest practitioners? Well. Perhaps not exactly. First and foremost, the 1v1 game has no collective project and lacks communication. The ball flies in highly linear paths and the angles of rebound are completely different from those observed in volleyball, namely there is no angle of deflection. Furthermore, there is no technical structure whatsoever that can be transferred to other game forms. So unlike many coaches, I would strongly suggest a reduced utilization of the 1v1 game in training, and certainly would not recommend its application in official competitions. Yes, the 1v1 game is simpler. It provides more contacts with the ball, but so do drills like dribbling the ball. And that logic has nothing to do with volleyball whatsoever. As we will see near the end of this presentation, there are strategies that afford even the weakest players to play 2v2. More on that later on. A side note concerning the underhand serve so popular in mini volleyball. First, let's make this clear. The underhand serve has no transfer at all for the overhead serve. Also, the purpose of every coach is to teach the overhead serve and eventually assist the players in abandoning the underhand serve altogether. So, my suggestion is, don't practice it. Certainly, don't waste your time providing highly technical feedbacks and especially do not spend time practicing tactical precision with this serve. In fact, every minute spent in this ability is a minute lost for other, more relevant game skills. But what if the player cannot overhead serve? Well, simply, simple, either allow him to practice from near the net. 
in a game situation, let him do that or simply toss the ball or even use a overhead pass. For competitive purposes, allow its emergence in the game, but try developing the alternative from the start. So, ultimately, we should view the underhand serve as the small wheels for learning how to ride a bike. Get rid of them as soon as possible. And what about the other game skills? Well, my advice is to develop an all-around player from the start. Teach all the game actions in all ages and levels. And please, start with a spike. It is the privileged action for achieving the goal of the game. It is the ultimate volleyball action and kids usually love it. So use it to motivate players and also to make them understand why the remaining game actions are so important. They serve either to promote spike of our own team or to counter spike of the opposite team. Lower the net to teach the block. Even if the shortest players will benefit from practicing only later on their development. Don't forget to teach the variations within each action. For example, in the forearm pass, teach kids to play in front of the body, turning, running, and back forearm passing, laterally passing the ball, and so on. Do that for every conceivable variation that might emerge in the game. And now back to the game, moving on to the 3v3. Again, let's first structure side out. The most common way for doing this is with a 1-2 structure. Notice how the setter should be facing the server and slightly away from the net, being ready for eventual short serves directed towards him. In case of a missed reception, the team should try to have two attack options available, as seen in this example. If the setter is forced to receive the serve, it should convert into an attacker, as seen here. With young kids, most often the setter would play the ball backwards and stay near the net. Besides the difficulty in the construction of the attack, it also leaves the team with only one attack option. The alternative we present here teaches the team how to convert an out-of-the-system out situation into an organized attack. The same is shown here, only with a variation. Of notice, this provides excellent, excellent opportunities for introducing attack at second contact and also the one foot takeoff for the setter who converts into an attacker and goes into attack on the right side of the net. At the end of this presentation, I provide links to videos of mine where this is shown being performed by mini volleyball players. Another possible structure is the O3. As most players are right handed, Almost every high-level team prefers having the setters near position 2-3. This has to do with biomechanical considerations that could, and could easily change had you five left-handed players in your team. Anyway, if mini volleyball is about preparing for the future, you can start right off by, the, by defining transferable situations, at least in cases such as the O3 structure. The back set and the utilization of the whole amplitude of the net can emerge by teaching a simple variation, which was already practiced in the 2v2 game. Also, define who sets the ball when the right side player has to receive the serve. In the 6v6, the middle player is recovering from a block can be solicited to set a ball defended by the setter. Conversely, you might define the libero as the one responsible for that situation. Transition. If using a 1 2 structure, again define where the block will take the parallel shot, block 1, or the cross court, block 2. The second situation is presented here. As in the 2v2, the blocker must learn how to read the set and the attacker, evaluate the situation and decide whether to block or to assist in defending short balls. Following the logic of side out, the setter blocker, in case of defending short balls, should convert into an attacker. This last situation is very simple but promotes low defense having to face attacks without the assistance of the block. 
attack coverage. In reality, very few game actions actually derive from attack coverage. Most attacks will either pass the block or be deflected directly, directly towards the ground. Nonetheless, especially in close matches, two or three balls recovered in such situations can make the difference between losing and winning. Attack coverage is all about the principle of coverage, not about highly structured systems, especially in the 6v6 with quick and combined attacks, predetermined attack coverage structures struggle to be implemented. And a note, the setter doesn't always have to go cover near, perhaps in 3v3 and in most forms of 4v4 it does, but as the game becomes more complex that principle certainly doesn't apply. Free ball and down ball. This first example is highly similar to side out in 1-2. In the O3 structure, we now have two different situations. The setter should wait in the case of a predictable down ball. Instead, the setter should anticipate in the case of predicting a free ball. Moreover, start teaching the concepts of A, B and C balls. This terminology has to do with the quality of the first contact and the three zones present different constraints for the construction of the attack with both tactical and technical implications. But note this, the definition of A, B and C zones varies considerably with team game and level and also with the size of the court. In this example, imagine a reception towards zone B a B ball, the setter should not face the end line and do a back set to position 2. Instead, it should rotate towards position 4, assuming a neutral position and, in case of intending to set towards position 2, before perform a side set over the shoulder. This skill will be very important later on the 6v6 game. The setter will learn to hide his intentions and also to keep visual control of the opponent's blockers. Finally, the 4v4 game. Side out. Commonly, mini volleyball teams receive in a 1 to 1 formation. The setter is again ready to receive short serves. In many countries, you should note that the server cannot participate in the, in the attack, it is the player in black. Here we see how to organize an attack using the setter as the attacker after, after having to receive a short serve. In this structure, the attackers are close to the attack zone, but there are far too many conflict zones, promoting hesitation and errors, especially in, age, in an age in which players usually communicate far below what is required. If your players are good in reception and possess good mobility, you can try and make the server assume every reception, at least for not very strong serves. It is an interesting solution, but hardly adjustable to strong serves and to most kids receiving skills. The best alternative, in my opinion, consists in moving the server a bit forward and the attackers a bit backward. Now we have far less conflict zones, plus the server avoids receiving balls that go out. A 2 plus 1 or 2 and a half structure can also be applied to remove the worst receiver attacker and hold the best attacker from the action of reception. And as we can see, two options are available. Finally, a still misunderstood and underrated concept, but nonetheless a very powerful one, penetration. As we will see, penetration in 4v4 games, especially in counter-attack, is not easy to perform and has a lot of moving and changing places and game options in a small court. Yet, it is a very powerful tool for preparing dynamic 6v6 systems. So, you will likely lose some more matches when in 4v4, but your team will certainly benefit when getting to 6v6. Transition. The diamond structure is the simplest one, but is also, in my opinion, the most poor in terms of teamwork and plasticity. It certainly presents almost no stimuli regard with regard to learning how to read the attacker. 
The fixed square presents a richer situation. Here we start with fixed square with positions 4 and 3 in the net, while player 2 defends on the right of the court. This system introduces team movements and a greater degree of decision making. It is also better prepared for blocking than is the diamond structure, so it is better suited for playing against teams that, that spike a lot. A number of defensive decisions already emerge in this system, as we can see here. If the attack is in position 4, it will have to be blocked by the setter. If, however, the, the setter chooses not to block, it should then assume a defensive position. If forced to defend the ball, it then has to convert into an attacker. The same logic applies when the opponent attacks on the other side of the net and forces the setter to defend the ball. Notice how the compensation performed by the position 2 player is highly similar to that of the setter in the 6v6 game using penetration. This alternate fixed square instead puts position 2 blocking alongside with position 3, while player 4 now defends on the left backcourt. As with the previous system, there has to be a previous definition of which blocker is responsible for blocking attacks in position 3. Following the logic of always being useful to the team, the setter again has to convert into an attacker whenever he has to defend the ball. This can happen when he chooses not to block. This is a variation, the setter now plays the ball further to the right and attacks in position 3. The fixed square systems can also be used to deploy double blocking, especially if the opponent has powerful attackers, but our defenders must be quick to read and react to the attacker's actions. Here we depict the 4 plus 3 fixed square only, but this is possible also with a 3 plus 2 fixed square system. Another very rich system is the mobile square, which starts off similarly to the diamond structure, but the team rotates in block, forming a square. The rotation, rotation will be clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the site which the setter is solicited to block. Once again, if during the rotation the setter decides not to block, you should quickly assume a defensive position and, if solicited to play first contact, convert into an attacker. If your opponent has a powerful attack in the three zones of the net, perhaps you wish to start with a 3-1 system. In this first example, the block will take the parallel shot. Block 1. The same can be done, but with the team choosing to block cross-court. As in the fixed square systems, double blocking is possible. The coach should define whether the block has to warn the defense in advance, for example by showing the defenders one finger to denote block, block 1 or two fingers to denote block 2, or if the blockers are free to choose in the moment and the defenders have to read accordingly. Personally, I believe the second choice is better for developing reading skills but may induce a greater rate of errors with beginners. Also, for some opponents with only one strong attack shot, previous arrangement of block positioning should be privileged. Although most mini-volleyball teams don't attack in Zone 3 regularly, I've suggested many systems that may turn that into a regularity, so expect to have to prepare for such situations. This is the case if you're using a mobile square or diamond system. An important note, the server, the defender further back in the court, may choose to be outside the shadow area of the block, or inside the shadow area. It will depend on whether the attacker is capable of turning to another location, and especially with such young players, if the blocker is effective in its action. If instead you choose a fixed square system, define in advance who blocks in the middle and then let the team rotate accordingly. The same scenario, but now starting from a 3-1 system. The free ball. 
Most young kids struggle to anticipate a free ball because they do not know how to read the opponent. A free ball will be due any time the opponent is facing severe difficulties in building the attack, especially if the second contact is low and placed far from the net. As soon as a free ball is identified, the player should start moving accordingly. The same scenario, but when using a different defensive system. The coach should define in advance which player should call free, the setter, the server, define that or risk late communication. Another example and yet another tip. As soon as players understand the logic of the free ball and start getting comfortable with it, they tend to assume it is going to be an easy ball. So easy indeed that they will relax too much and become careless. This in turn will induce a very high rate of errors, unnecessary errors so demand high rates of success when practicing such balls. If you play with penetration, the fixed square with players 3 plus 2 blocking is the best suited system, as it keeps the setter defending in a position similar to where he will have to defend in the future 6v6 game. Notice how the setter penetrates before the opponent having contacted the ball. Now the last example, with, uh, starting with a 3-1 system, and moving on to the down ball. As the opponent can play downward tra trajectories, the players should now assume a lower and more mobile defensive position. Another example. Now with a fixed square. And finally, the case with penetration. Unlike what happened with the free ball, the setter now waits and only advances towards the net after the opponent having played the ball. The idea is the setter assuming a defensive role just in case. This is the last example. So we've basically covered a lot of issues. It is up to the coach to choose the systems more fitting to his or her team. A note with regard to the power of asymmetry. Practicing with asymmetric courts can potentiate certain behaviors. In this particular example, we can stipulate a 4v4 game with attack only by position 4. Obviously, this type of court will stimulate the player 4 to attack cross court, deep behind the block, or attempt a block out. Attacks toward the middle of the court or to the parallel are out. So choose whichever type of court design fits your interests the best because this logic can help you developing powerful game actions that players could otherwise avoid inhibiting their future development. In this last section we will focus on manipulating the rules of the game in order to promote certain pedagogic purposes. First, think outside the box and move beyond the official rules. However, reflect upon the how and the when of using a modified rule. Remember when I criticized the 1v1 game? Well, this first rule is designed especially for very low skilled players to be able to play the 2v2 game. This rule keeps the ball in flight for at least more than one contact and therefore allows coaches to develop a game project even when facing the lowest levels of skill. Some care should be taken, of course. First, define a maximum of two seconds of grabbing the ball. More than that will largely reduce the rhythm of the game. Also, your young player starts to understand that he has to make decisions and he has to make them fast. So, also don't let the player simply toss the ball to the setter. Make him perform a self-toss followed by an overhead set. And thereby we have the fundamental logic of the game kicking off in a very facilitated way. Allowing a double touch in the first contact fulfills similar goals. Again, the idea is to promote a game project as less plays will end because of a mistake during the first contact. If your players are already reasonable when playing first contact, but still not perfect, and if the setter still struggles to transform a reasonable first contact into a proper set, then why not apply the rule of grabbing the ball to the, in the second contact instead of the first? Now, of course, the same coaching principles should apply. Finally, 
We can also apply a similar logic to the third contact only, but now our purpose is radically different. This rule allows a better structuring of defensive positions and of attack coverage positions. So it is especially useful when teaching the player to position themselves, more so if you're approaching a new, more complex defensive system or even an attack coverage principle. Now, in many countries, many volleyball rules demand a minimum of two to three contacts, with the exception of blocking and serve. The idea is to promote teamwork, avoiding devolutions of the ball with only one contact. But in training sessions, we could allow players to use only one contact if they wish to. Besides developing a kind of streetwise smartness, exploring distractions of the opponents, it is especially useful to make players not disconnect from the game. If they can put the ball into the opponent's court with only one contact, then the opponent is also inhibited of doing so. So when the ball crosses the net to the other side, players can simply relax and stop playing for a few seconds, since the opponent has to perform at least two contacts. This is not a good behavior, and it certainly is harmful for the, for, for the 6v6 game. So why not allow just one contact already in mini volleyball, at least in some training sessions? Taking this logic to the extreme, we can sometimes make the players use one contact only. Despite collective structure being highly compromised, every player will have to be permanently ready to act. Again, a streetwise cleverness is developed through such games. However, I would advise not to abuse this rule, of course, since team structure nearly disappears. Another possibility is to make two contacts mandatory. Of the two advantages highlighted here, I would emphasize the pressure it places on the first contact having to be high and well placed in order for someone to attack the ball during the second contact. Many kids fear mistakes and in many situations choose to be conservative. They choose immediate success instead of performing actions that will be relevant in the near future. So why not force them to jump when putting the ball towards the opponent? Besides developing the jumping ability, it will put pressure on the setter to place the ball high enough. Furthermore, ball trajectories will more likely be descending, stimulating the need for blocking and for a more effective low defense. This rule can be used in isolation or in combination with the previous one. The idea is to make the player comfortable with finalization using only one hand, thereby developing the specific dexterity which is so important for volleyball. Many kids prefer to play it safe using overhead pass, but we should really stimulate them to assume higher risks, developing the spike and the tip and using them every time. This rule is especially important during the 2v2 but can also be used on the 3v3 and 4v4 games. Again. Take the player away from his comfort zone and make him use back set instead of front set. We can also stipulate that the second contact has to be made using jump set. It puts pressure for the first contact to be high enough. The setter now starts accelerating the game and there is a menace of attacking in the second contact. Now, I'm particularly fond of this rule. Before the game starts, your players have to define who are the weakest links in the opposing team. This already implies they have to analyze the opponents and furthermore take responsibility for their decisions. This principle is something you will want your players to do in competition all the time. But usually it's not a naturally emerging behavior in most kids. In training sessions, this brings about a secondary yet very powerful effect of constantly soliciting the weakest players in the game. This will force them to play the ball often, be ready all the time, assume responsibility and, in consequence, to develop their own skills. Instead of practicing within the system only, start making your players feel comfortable when playing out of the system. For example, start a game with B or C balls for the second contact. Alternatively, alternatively start with a C ball for the third contact. Your athletes must develop a sense of turning every bad situation into a positive thing. 
This last rule is very popular, but in my opinion, it drastically changes the analysis of trajectories and your relationship with the ball, as you will not attempt to intercept it before falling into the ground. As this is essential for being a volleyball player, I would advise not to use this rule, at least not to use it often. A lot of stuff was covered here, and I have video support for many of the mentioned situations, though not all of them. I hope to have provided interesting concepts and good work to every mini-volleyball coach out there. Thank you very much.